Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so I want to try something different in this video, right? I'm kind of getting a little bored of, of making videos about stories all the time. So I want to try something different. And what I want to do is I want to find an answer to two questions in the most unbiased way that we can. The first question, does the Joker deserve to be executed for his crimes? And the second question, if he does, is it legal to do it? So let's create a situation here, right? Let's kind of follow in the form and function of the Joker's history. And let's say that the Joker had committed some crime, right? He committed some act. And by virtue of his direct action, he took the life of somebody else, right? Like put a gun to somebody's head and now they're gone, right? And so as a result of that, the city of Gotham is like, okay, we're going to put this guy on trial, right? You know, Batman has been uh, throwing this guy into Arkham Asylum. He always escapes Arkham Asylum. We've had enough of it. We're going to put this guy on trial and then we're going to go from there. Uh, and so when that happens, the trial basically goes in this fashion. The prosecution is, of course, presenting a case whereby the Joker's guilty for all of his actions or presenting, presenting evidence for this particular crime and so on and so forth. And the defense is trying to demonstrate the Joker's not guilty of his crime. And in an effort to demonstrate a lack of guilt, the defense goes for the insanity plea and says the Joker is not guilty by reason of mental defect. Now, the question is, how do they present this case? Okay, so when it comes to the insanity defense in, in uh, the legal system, this actually kind of goes back, at least in terms of the first real huge popular case, goes back to 1843 in Britain. And the reason why that matters is because the United States legal system is largely based on English common law, right? And it made sense because the early United States settlers were basically separatists uh, from Britain who defected over here. Once the United States, or at least in its, its earlier days, as the colonies began to form some manner of a government in and of itself, they basically went with what they knew. And what they knew was English common law. And so in taking English common law and adapting it to the United States, a lot of the legal precedents and a lot of the laws that, have, that are established here are based on English laws. Now, as time has progressed, we've created our own legal system of sorts that has rules that are different from what England has, but the foundation for the most part remains the same. And so in 1843, there was the creation of something called the McNaughton Laws. I think it was either McNaughton Laws or McNaughton Laws. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce his name. But this came out of a case where a guy named Daniel McNaughton had killed a man by the name of Edward Drummond. Now, Edward Drummond was not the target of Daniel McNaughton. It was actually the British prime minister named Robert Peel. But Daniel McNaughton had committed this act believing that Drummond was Robert Peel because he had believed he was being persecuted by the British prime minister and the British government. The result of this is that when the whole case went to trial, uh, Daniel McNaughton basically said, I was driven to my actions because I felt like I was being persecuted, which ultimately led to this revelation that Daniel McNaughton's cognitive understanding of the world around him, which is to say how the world actually exists versus how Daniel believes the world exists were not in line, that he saw the world one way when the world was actually another, that he was not actually being persecuted. And so what this did is it allowed for a finding of uh, not guilty by reason of mental defect, and Daniel spent the rest of his days in a mental asylum. Now, this had a huge backlash at the time, and the reason why was because it was viewed by Queen Victoria, as well as other members of the, really the British government itself, as well as the, the British monarchy, that the laws, the rules laid down that established whether or not a person could be found, uh, found insane were too lacks. And so in response to this, the McNaughton laws were created to focus on cognitive reasoning, to focus on answering the question, does a person truly understand what's going on in the world around them? And to this day, the McNaughton laws are still used, right? They're, they're still used for the most part uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And they've been expanded on and sort of changed as time has gone on. But the overall gist is that it focused on the creation of a standard for the jury, as well as establishing two main components. The first is that when the defense comes along and says, uh, the Joker's not guilty by reason of insanity, the jury has to assume the Joker's sane. And so what the defense has to do is prove two things, or at least one of two things. The first is that the defense has to prove that the Joker didn't know what he was doing at the time that he did it, right? He didn't know that he was killing a person. The second is that the defense would have to establish that at the time the Joker committed the act, the Joker didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. If these two components are satisfied, then the Joker is deemed to be not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, in addition to the McNaughton laws, there have also been a series of other legal doctrines that have been introduced over the years. For example, you have what's called the irresistible impulse test. And where the McNaughton laws focuses on your ability to understand the world around you, the irresistible impulse test focuses on the notion of whether or not your will is your own, which is to say it was outside of your own reasonable control. You may not have wanted to, but ultimately you felt like you had to. In 1972, there was the introduction of what's called the model penal code. And this was introduced by the American Law Institute, which is really like a panel of, of legal experts uh, that basically established kind of a new rule for insanity and 
offer the idea that a person that does not possess quote unquote substantial capacity either to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law could be found not guilty by reason of mental insanity. And in 1984, in one of the more recent rulings, there was the Comprehensive Crime Control Act, which basically kind of brought back or, or saw us return to the notion of understanding the difference between right and wrong based on existing societal laws. And so if you committed that act and didn't understand that killing a person was wrong, well, then you could be found not guilty by reason of mental defect. And so with all that out of the way, there's a couple questions that we need to ask about this, you know, with this, this mock trial that we're doing more or less, and this question of whether or not the Joker's truly insane and whether or not he should be executed and whether or not it's legal, right? So the first question we have to ask here is, how does the Joker see the world? Which is to say, does he see the world the way it truly is, or does he see the world the way he believes it is? And the reality is that the Joker sees the world the way he believes it is. He made a conscious choice. This goes back to the story of the killing joke, the most consistently reviewed or consistently perceived origin of the Joker. And in that story, it just focuses on this idea that all it ever takes is one bad day. And where it would be easy to look at that and say the Joker went insane, in reality, he didn't. There's this really good monologue he does where he's talking about the notion of like walking down memory lane and experiencing these bad things in our past or reminding ourselves of these bad things that we've dealt with. And where he's talking about these memories, he asks, can we live without them? Memories are what our reason is based upon. If we cannot face them, we deny reason itself. Although why not? We aren't contractually tied down to rationality. There is no sanity clause. So when you find yourself locked into an unpleasant train of thought, heading for the places in your past where the screaming is unbearable, remember, there's always madness. Madness is the emergency exit. The, the Joker in that moment, at the end of that, or really in the, the end of his origin, when he first became the Joker, chose that, but he gave in to his darker side. He gave in to the part of himself that just said, the hell with it all. I'm just gonna go do whatever it is that I wanna do. I don't care about the rules of society or anything along those lines. Making that rational choice and putting himself on that path really, I think, demonstrates the fact that the Joker's not truly insane. The next question here is, does the Joker know what he's doing when he commits these crimes? And the answer to that question is yes. During the story of Batman Death of the Family by Scott Snyder, there's a point where the Joker confronts Batman just before he reveals to Bruce that he knows his identity as well as the identities of all the other members of the Bat family. And what he does here is he references the role of the Jester. And he says, the Jester's job is to entertain, but he often has another job too, a deeper job, and that's to deliver bad news to the king, the worst news of the kingdom. The fleet has holes, the army turned pacifist, the children's hands have rotted off, and they can't clap for fairies anymore. More. And that's all I've ever tried to do for you. Bring you the worst news of your own heart so you might survive it, laugh at it even, and become strong. Now what this shows is that the Joker understands what it is that he's doing. Not only that, the motivation of the Joker is predicated on making Batman better. And so while he does do some pretty heinous things, it's not arbitrary. It doesn't seem to have any real lack of rhyme or reason to it. It's done to fulfill a particular purpose. However, this is both expanded on and complicated by two other factors. The next factor really comes from Batman Legends of the Dark Knight when the Joker is essentially mortally wounded and then subjected to the Lazarus Pits. And under normal circumstances, individuals who are resurrected through the Lazarus Pits experience momentary insanity. The Joker, however, reverts to a more lucid, insane state and then demonstrates an understanding that his actions are wrong. And so what this means is that the Joker seems to have some sort of insane element to him. However, when you go back to the events of, of Scott Snyder's death of the family, when Batman or when Bruce Wayne approaches Joker at the end of the story and confronts Joker with the knowledge that Joker seems to know the identity of Bruce as well as the rest of the Bat family, the Joker doesn't care. The only real thing the Joker cares about is continuing the game between himself and Batman. But the next question to ask here is, does the Joker know that what he's doing is wrong? And to build on that, does the Joker know the difference between right and wrong? And again, the answer here is yes. Referencing the story yet again of Scott Snyder's death of the family, there's a point whereby the Joker is talking to Harvey Dent. And what he says is, you know it's all true. All it took was a little acid to the face and everything you stood for got thrown out the window. And it turns out you were just waiting for the chance to pretend to be one of the gangsters you used to lock away. And heck, in this city, that brand of justice is perfect. The kind of justice that's meaningless, where one side of the coin is just as good as the other, where there's no difference between between right and wrong. 
And so what this means is that the Joker understands the difference between right and wrong. If the Joker didn't understand right and wrong, if he didn't grasp these two concepts, they would be lost on him. They'd be totally irrelevant to him. A really good example of this is in the movie Sphere, when Samuel Jackson's character is talking about an organism that couldn't be killed. And what he says is that a creature that couldn't be killed wouldn't think the killing was right or wrong. It would have no concept of it. And with the Joker, it would be the same way. If the idea of good and evil were lost on the Joker, then he wouldn't really consider himself doing anything good or evil and wouldn't understand the concepts. Instead, as far as the Joker is concerned, he would just be committing a series of acts that's no different than breathing or picking up a pencil or a pen or something of that sort. But the fact that the Joker can look at Harvey Dent and make a case for a type of lawlessness where right and wrong don't exist means that the Joker understands the concepts of right and wrong, which means that he understands that what he's doing is either right or wrong. And by virtue of the fact that the Joker understands the notion of justice means the Joker understands what justice stands for. Ergo, the Joker understands what he's doing is wrong. And so the final question to ask here as to whether or not the Joker can be determined to be insane is the question, is the Joker in control of his own actions? Physically? Yes, he is. Mentally? No, he's not. The reality here is that while the Joker did choose to let in the madness of his own life at the end of The Killing Joke and surrender to his darker side, as time has passed, this darker element has really become more of a compulsion than anything else. The need for Batman to be the antithesis to himself is an absolute aspect of his character, and this is laid out perfectly in Batman issue number 49 by Tom King. In a conversation with Catwoman as to why it is that she cannot marry Bruce Wayne, the Joker says, We all loved him. We wanted him to love us. That's everything. But he never loved us. He always loved you. All I'd have to do is kill everyone. Harvey, Edward, Oswald, on and on. Me, but not you. It'd be so easy, and he'd be so happy. But Selina, don't you understand? That's why I'm here now with you. If I did that, if you did this wedding, if he found some joy, he'd lose the frown and the costume and the big black bat. He can't be happy and also be Batman. I need him to stand between me and everything. You don't understand, no one understands. I can kill everything and I need him to stop me. This statement combined with Batman, death of the family, both at the point where the Joker reveals that everything he does is for the purpose of making Batman stronger, as well as Bruce Wayne coming to the realization that yes, the Joker knows his identity, but doesn't care, and the Joker only cares about the cat and mouse game between the two of them, illustrates the fact that yes, Joker forms his own schemes, yes, Joker engages in his own plans, but at the end of the day, the mind of Joker in terms of how he views the world and all those things is basically secondary to the compulsion that the Joker has to constantly engage in an act whereby Batman will ultimately track him down. It's a compulsive action, it's a compulsive behavior, and it's something the Joker simply cannot control. And so given what we've laid out here by virtue of the Joker's own admission, the Joker does understand what he's doing when he's committing these crimes, the Joker does understand the difference between right and wrong, and the Joker does understand that what he's doing is wrong, despite the fact that this is a compulsion. And so what this means is the Joker does not appear to be insane, because only one out of these four particular principles has been found as being satisfied by virtue of what the definition of insanity calls for when it comes to a trial. However, if we go with the universally accepted standard that the Joker is actually insane, then the question becomes, should the Joker be executed anyway, and is it legal to do it? In order to answer this, we have to ask the question, is there any possibility that the Joker can be rehabilitated or in some way his mental illness can be corrected to allow him to become a productive member of society? And the answer to that question is no. And this comes from a couple different sources. The first source is pretty much everything we've laid out so far, especially when it comes to the irresistible impulse, this idea that he has to have this game between himself and Batman. This combined with the various schemes that he's committed over the years and his willful disregard for human life shows that the only overriding factor the Joker has is that this game continue on. This is compounded by Batman Cacophony issues 1 through 3 when the Joker says that he won't stop killing until Batman himself is dead. And so what this means is that so long as Batman is alive, the Joker won't stop. He'll keep going and going and going. He'll escape Arkham Asylum the way that he always does. None of the mental health institutions will be able to hold him. He'll always find a way to get back to engaging into his schemes and he'll always be captured and the cycle will continue. And so to answer the question, should the Joker be executed? The answer is yes, because the Joker represents a clear and present danger to the mortal lives of the citizens of Gotham and will kill as many of them as he needs to in order to ensure the game between himself and Batman continues on. The problem with this is that it's not legal for that to happen. 
This was established in 1986 in the Supreme Court case Ford v. Wainwright, whereby a guy named Alvin Bernard Ford was convicted of murder in 1974 and sentenced to death in the state of Florida. However, Ford's mental health had diminished to the point that by the time his execution was supposed to have happened, he had exhibited signs of paranoid schizophrenia. And under the Eighth Amendment, the Supreme Court ruled that executing somebody who was mentally ill amounted to cruel and unusual punishment. And so the result was that if a person's mental competency for execution or trial was in question, that they would in turn be given a trial to establish their mental competency. And if they were deemed to be mentally ill, execution would no longer be allowed. And so that gives us the answer to the question. Should the Joker be executed? Yes, because it's what's best for Gotham City. Can he legally be executed? No, not according to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. This was fun. I enjoyed this. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. Maybe we'll do it with something else, do it like a different character or something along those lines. And I will catch you all later. Peace. We've got some new patrons in our top tiers over on patreon.com slash comics explain. I want to give a shout out to Jason C, Austin S, Austin H, Philip, and Austin B, as well as Steven Z, Eagle F, Joey M, and Jeff R, as well as Genosis916. As always, we just usually keep the last name to an initial. It helps you guys to maintain your anonymity. Some of you guys have expressed concern about having like your first and last name thrown out there for the world to see. I do not blame you. For you guys who have joined up as part of our Patreon tiers that are eligible for Rob Core Honor Guard rings. Those whose rings have been sent out, you should already have them. If you're a new person who just joined up and you've been part of this tier for a month, your ring will be mailed out to you. So I wanna say thank you guys for being patrons.